Join me in the call to worship. Come with your questions, come with your awe, for the God who hovers over the chaos meets us in this place. Come with your energy, come with your weariness, for the God who breathes new life into the dust meets us in this place. Come with your sadness, come with your joy, for the God who dared to become human meets us in this place. Pray with me. Almighty God, we welcome you this morning in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. We invoke the strong name of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and pray that you would be in our midst. Father, that we would marvel in your work of creation. Jesus, that we would worship because of the redemption that you offer. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you would have your way in each one of us, that when we leave this place, we might be more like Jesus than when we first walked in. It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, I invite you to take out your uh, GPS, your Grow, Pray, and Study Guide. Uh, there you'll see a calendar, announcements, a prayer list that we'll need later in the service, as well as discussion questions that help you to go deeper into today's message. A uh, few announcements I want to share. Uh, next Sunday, one worship service at 10 o'clock, because it's a fifth Sunday. Say it with me, 10 o'clock. If you show up at 8.30, I got nothing for you. 10 o'clock, uh, our preacher uh, will be my, my mentor and coach, George Acevedo from Grace Church in Cape Coral, Florida. Uh, there are note cards and pre-addressed envelopes at the Connection Center to send a note of welcome to Jackie Young, who will be our next associate pastor come uh, July 1st. Please uh, send one of those and help her to feel welcomed. On June the 5th, uh, we're going to have a retirement celebration for Pastor Kathy in between the two services. Uh, it'll start at 945 and breakfast will be served. June the 12th, there will be no in-person worship because we serve at the Turkey Festival uh, food line. Uh, so no in-person worship that day and the sign-up sheets for service at the Turkey Festival are available in the Narthex uh, please take a look at those and, and sign up so that we can fill, fill all of those slots and serve our community well. There are several other announcements there that you can take a look at uh, as you have time and find other ways to plug in to the life of the church. For now, I want to uh, lead us into a time of worship through giving. Uh, that we do every time we come together as followers of Jesus, where we give back to God out of that which he has given to us. So would the ushers come and move among us as we continue to worship. from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and
Thank you, gracious God, for all of the gifts that you pour into our lives, for the abundance that we have, for you meeting every need. And just now we thank you for the opportunity to worship you through giving. And we pray that you would take these gifts, tithes, gifts, and love offerings, and use them for your kingdom, to expand your kingdom for the honor and glory of your name here in Trema and around the world. We pray that you would bless the gift as well as the giver. And we offer these to you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated as we continue uh, to worship by singing, Breathe on me, Breath of God. I want to draw your attention to the blue insert in your worship folder, if you would take that out. Today is the day that we bless our graduates. If there are any graduates here, would you please come forward? And I don't see any at this service, but we still need to bless them. So if you would hang on to this uh, blue list, you have a list of those who've graduated from our church family, eighth grade, high school, and college. So let us be in an attitude of prayer as we bless these graduates. Oh, Father God, we hold in our hand a list of those who have reached a, a pivotal time in their life, Lord. We're they grateful for your provision for them. Lord, we ask for your blessing upon them as they move to the next step in their life. Lord, may they continue to have open minds, open hearts, balanced emotions. May you bless them, Lord, with the assurance of your love. May they continue to grow in the knowledge of who you are. May they continue to seek you. And may they continue to be transformed by your love. We hold them up to you, Lord, and ask that you hold them and continue to guide them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We have an opportunity now to go to the Lord and lift up those on your yellow insert. If you'll take that out and hold that in your hand, we'll pray for these folks. We'll take a couple of minutes of silent prayer, and then we'll walk through this list together. Breathe on us, breath of God. Help us to sense your presence 
at such a deep level, Lord, that nothing else matters, that we don't experience anything else but your presence. Lord, we are so grateful to be able to come into this place and worship you, lifting you on high, singing your praises, hearing your words proclaimed. sharing our joys and concerns, having fellowship with one another. Breathe on us, breath of God. As we look at this list, Lord, we've just prayed for the graduates, and now we have a list in front of us, Lord, of people who have requested prayer. Each and every situation, Lord, is unique. You hold each one in the palm of your hand. You know their situation. You love them dearly. Breathe on them, breath of God. We ask, Lord, that you work in each and every person's life in such a way that they sense your breath, that they know they're not alone, that whatever they face, Lord, is not as great as you are in their life. I pray, Lord, for each and every person to know that your love is present, is deep, is everlasting. And Lord, as we minister to these people, help us to reach out to them, whether it be a phone call or a card or a visit. Help us, Lord, to encourage them in their walk with you. And Lord, I pray for this upcoming Turkey Festival that we may be the church as we serve. Lord, we may be the only Jesus that people will see that day. We're out in the community, Lord, sharing your love and help us to do that and to do that well. Help us to be the church. Lord, as we continue the work of your Son, in this broken, sin-filled world. Encourage us, strengthen us, transform us. Put us in positions, Lord, to where we can be a disciple of Jesus. May we complete your mission. We stand, Lord, in humble adoration of the fact that you are even mindful of us but so much so that you call us, equip us, and send us out. So help us to do just that, Lord. We will give you all the thanks and praise in Jesus' name. We pray these things in your Son's name, praying as Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand and affirm our faith together. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. Let us say this together. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ. Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself 
in the service of love and set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. You may be seated. Michael, that's one of those uh, camp songs that we used to sing around the fire at, uh, at uh, church camp. So I was instantly back at Montgomery Christian Service Camp. Uh, and I, it's great because I was reminded this morning that in two weeks it'll be 21 years of following Jesus. The best, best decision I've ever made at that week of church camp. Scripture reading this morning as we wrap up this series on uh, Bless This Mess is Genesis chapter 2 verse 18, and then verses 21 to 25. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. 
Then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is God's word and it is true. Let all who believe say amen. Pray with me. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Grant, O God, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts would indeed find acceptance in your sight, God who is our strength and our Redeemer. For it's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Well, it finally happened. We were riding in the car not too long ago, and without any warning at all, I was in my own little world driving along. Without so much as one bit of warning, Brittany reached over and she plucked a hair right out of my head. I said, what'd you do that for? She said, you had a gray hair. It's finally happened. And now, I see them everywhere. There's, there's gray crouching into my hairline all throughout my beard. There's even hair, Brittany pointed out, gray hair starting to come out of my ears. And Brittany, every time we're in the car, just keeps reaching over and plucking them out. I feel like it's taken our relationship to a whole new level. Today we're dealing with a topic much more serious than messy hair. We, we've been talking about messy relationships and messy lives and how the good news is that in the midst of all of it, God enters into our messes and he uses his grace to fill in the gaps in our relationships because God wants to make something beautiful out of our brokenness and he wants to bless our mess. He, he wants to come to us in, in this time of need and bless us. And we've been reminded throughout this series that God first wants to restore our messy relationship with him. Jesus came that we could have a relationship with God and be forgiven and set free. And once that relationship is restored, then it begins to spill over into all of our other relationships. Grace can be spilled out into every relationship in our life. So we've spent our time since that first week talking about how God can bless our relationships in general the messy relationships that exist in the parent-child relationship, in our dysfunctional families. God wants to bless relationships of all kind. Today we're considering how God wants to bless messy marriages. And, and whether or not you're, you're currently married, these principles still apply to your closest relationships, so don't tune out. And, and I know this whole topic of marriage can be really messy, these days. Being married is tough, and it's often very messy. In the, in the just over 13 years that Brittany and I have been married, we've walked through some very difficult and messy seasons that were frankly very painful. And Brittany has often reminded me in those moments that since she's a registered nurse, she has about a hundred different ways she could kill me and make it look like an accident. Marriage is messy. When I think about this topic of marriage, I, I, I think about people who've experienced a divorce, dear friends of mine and family members, that, that it's very, very painful for them. And then still there are other people who are single and longing to get married, and that, that, that causes a, a void of pain in their lives. O others struggle with this whole topic of marriage because our culture has decided to put its own takes on the definition of marriage. And that debate can end up with all sorts of loads of pain all around it. Looking at this topic, some people just decide that they're going to do away with marriage altogether. They're going to delay marriage. They're going to dismiss it. When it comes to the topic of marriage, let's admit it, it's a mess. We could say that we need more than an episode of The Bachelor to help us to navigate this topic. Uh, in, in fact, I was caught in one of those train wreck-like situations, you know, where, where you don't want to watch but you can't look away. When, when Brittany and I ran across a new Netflix series not long ago called Ultimatum, 
And an ultimatum, the long-term dating couples who haven't decided whether they're going to get married or not go on this reality show, and one of them issues an ultimatum. Either we get married or we're done. That sounds simple enough, but they take it further, as reality TV does. Uh, they get together with all sorts of other groups of, of couples in the same situation, and they swap partners for trial engagements to see if the grass is really greener. Can we get any more dramatic? Can we get any farther from what's true and right and good? So today, we're going to turn to God in the moments of mess. As we do, the, the first thing I want to offer to all of us, no matter where we are, no matter what kind of relationships we're in, is just to breathe and rest in God's grace for these moments. In the mess of all of our relationships, I've, I'm reminded of a quote by an author named Bill Thrall. And, and he says this, Grace is the face that God wears when he encounters our imperfections. Grace is the face that God wears when he encounters our imperfections. God sees us in our lives. God sees us in our brokenness. He sees us in our messiness. He doesn't shake an angry finger at us and condemn us or curse us. Grace is the face that God wears when he encounters our messes. So rest in his grace as we look at another set of relationships. And as we do, we're going back to the very beginning of the Bible. We're, we're, we're going to look at, at two different kind of versions of the creation story that happen in, in Genesis, and they're told back to back with one another, and they contain ancient wisdom for us that can help us navigate, even in 2022, the messiness of our lives in a host of topics, especially today, the topic of marriage. So I read for you Genesis 2 as we began the sermon, uh, but I want to back up a second to Genesis 1, 27 to 28. And this is how, at the wrap-up of creation, it says this. So God created humans in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. There's a lot just in those few verses. And I'm going to highlight a couple of things just from those first two verses. In these verses, all the way back in Genesis, the Bible teaches that both man and woman were created in God's image, and they were designed to be in relationship with God. This is where our understanding of relationships begins, because it points to something very important in all relationships. And it's this. Every single person that you've ever met including the person that you look at in the mirror each morning, is created in the image and likeness of God. You are created in the image of God. The Bible begins with this wonderful news. This means that you, yes, you are a person of incredible sacred worth. And so is every other person that you've ever met. Notice what it doesn't say as we talk about marriage. It doesn't say that you're only a whole and complete person if you're married. So single people don't hear that this morning. Singleness is a calling, whether for your whole life or for a season, just in the same way that marriage is. But when it comes to, to marriage, what do these verses tell us? It means, husbands, your wife is created in the image of God. Honor her. Wives, your husband is created in the image of God. Honor him. It means that just as our God exists in community as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we're designed to be in this community of relationship with one another. And in the messiness of marriage, sometimes we need to be reminded of very simple things that we can do to honor one another in these closest types of relationships. But listen, Brittany will be the first one to tell you, and in fact, she did tell you all when we preached together on forgiveness in marriage a couple of years ago, she's the first to tell you that I am not an expert on marriage. Neither is she. In our married life together, we've come to understand that we're two imperfect people trying to build something good together. And we need to all be reminded of some very practical things we can do to honor one another. And the first one that I've observed in a lot of marriages is just take some time for each other. 
Different seasons in life make this look different. Right now, for us, it looks like catching five minutes just to talk before the baby starts crying. Not long ago, it looked like sneaking off to lunch together while the kids were at school. Whatever that looks like for you as, as a retired couple or empty nesters or, or even ships that are just passing in the night with all of the kids' activities, taking some time for each other shows your heart's true intent. Second, listen to one another. We can both be really good at this and really awful at this. When we're good at it, man, we're on. No therapist in the world would have anything to say to us. But when we're awful... For us, it's because of our smartphones. The other day, I was telling Brittany something that I thought was really, really important. And I went through the whole story, and when I looked up, she was still scrolling her phone. I said, I could have just told you that my arm had been severed, and I was losing blood at a rapid pace, and you would have had no idea. And don't let me off the hook. I can be just as guilty. She's gotten all the way through a whole story, and then she'll realize that I'm still watching a ball game. She'll say, did you hear anything I just said? Turn off the TV. Put down the tablet or the smartphone. Tune out all of the other distractions and just listen. When we listen to our spouse, when we listen to people that we're in deep relationship with, we honor them by adding value to them. And men, especially men, when your wife speaks, listen. Don't interrupt and try to fix it. We're, we try to be Mr. Fix-It too much. Sometimes she doesn't want your advice. She just wants you to listen. And if you're listening to one another, this is both of you, in the middle of conflict, when it's your turn to talk, use I statements. Say, I'm really confused right now, instead of, you're a really confusing person. I've used both of those statements in marriage, and one of them works out better than the other. It's the same thought, but it comes across different. Third, the last thing I want to suggest on how this honoring one another can play out is not just listen, but also forgive one another. Any marriage, any good marriage, has to be a union of two great forgivers. Each of us in in marriage, both husbands and wives, need lots of grace. Because the people that we love the most and love the best are also going to see the most human and frail and broken side of us. And they always end up being the people, inevitably, that we hurt the most. So we we need to grace one another with the grace that we've received from Jesus, to bless one another with the gift of forgiveness. That's where the prayer that Jesus taught us comes in when he says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. The fulfillment of that prayer starts at home. Those are three just really simple ways that we honor the sacred worth of one another in relationship, noting that we're created in the image of God, But I want to go a little deeper into this story from Genesis to focus on the the, the whole idea in the scripture that I read earlier about reigning together. Not only were Adam and Eve both created in the image of God, but they were given dominion together over all of creation. Now, remember in this story in Genesis, this is before sin has entered the picture in the story of scripture and in the human story. Uh, There's no sin in this time. Think about those days. A perfect Garden of Eden setting. Both of them had a relationship with God, a relationship with one another, where they could walk with God in the cool of the day. God gave them this assignment to reign over creation. They had responsibilities. And since the days of Genesis, men and women were were co-equal in co-reigning over what God had entrusted to them. That means that they were meant to work together. And like I mentioned, God exists in community and Trinity and this partnership of of God. And in that, God calls husbands and wives to the same kind of responsibility, same kind of community where they share responsibilities, where they, they reign and have dominion over and give care to over what is given to them. So married people, no matter what age, I want you to think about all that God has entrusted to your care. Maybe it's children. Maybe you want to make a list of all the things that God has entrusted to your household. Think about your children, your grandchildren. Maybe the responsibilities you have with your career or sources of income. Those those properties or anything else that God has blessed you with, recognizing that every good and perfect gift comes from God. So God has given you these things together to have responsibility over. 
The same is true with your gifts to honor another's gifts, to help them, to encourage one another, to use those gifts to serve God and his kingdom. And that, and let me get real practical with that. That shared responsibility even includes things as mundane as household chores. I'm talking to myself. I've struggled with this. It seems like the laundry fairy that I knew growing up left after I got married, and she's never returned. For me, that means I've got to do some laundry. I've got to throw my clothes in the hamper. I couldn't find it, uh, but Brittany sent me a text message one time a couple years ago. It was a picture of a pair of my jeans laying in the floor next to the hamper, and the text just said, so close, you almost had it. It means that I have to recognize that trash doesn't just wander out to the curb, uh, and uh, there, there, to my knowledge, there has not yet been invented a self-loading dishwasher. These and many other responsibilities given to a household are shared. We can divide and conquer according to the gifts and abilities that God has given us, but in that sharing, we divide and conquer together instead of just divide and try to conquer. These are the ways that God has, has called in marriage for us to reign and manage what God has blessed us with. And that's the key word that, that we see in the first passage that I read the second version of the creation story. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman. For out of man this one was taken. Therefore a man leaves his mother and father and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. There's a lot in these verses. A lot. I just want to unpack a few thoughts. First, this is the first time in Scripture that God says that something is not good. Up to this point, we're reading the creation story, and there's this this, this beautiful Hebrew word, tov, God creates something and he saw that it was tov. He creates, the, he creates the, the man in his own image. He creates Adam and he says that it's tov meod. It's very good. This is the first time that God says something is not good. It's not good for the man to be alone. And then there's another word that occurs early in the passage. It's helper. I'll make a helper, the Lord says, who's just right for the man. Now, this has been misunderstood for a long time. The word helper here, or helpmate, is a combination of two Hebrew words. The first is desert, which is used to mean strength. And the second word is connect, that means a perfect counterpart. She is a helper to Adam because they connect their strength and complement each other. Out of man she was taken... It's a side-by-side metaphor and imagery that that tells us that Adam and Eve were to walk side-by-side and rule side-by-side, that God had blessed them both with one another. Adam notices God's handiwork in someone so different, yet so familiar. At last, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And that's so important to a, a biblical understanding of marriage. Jesus actually reflects back to this passage in Matthew 19. Uh, He responds to a question, and he says, Haven't you read the scriptures? They record that from the beginning God made them male and female. These words will be familiar. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one since they are no longer two. But let no one split apart what God has joined together. Jesus adds this this little line about the two being joined and, and not splitting apart what God has put together because he's pointing to the fact that marriage is not just a contract between two good looking people who want to hang out with one another. It's a covenant that two people make with the, each other but also with God. And there's a big difference between a contract and a covenant. What's a contract? I was thinking about this the other day. Now that things have opened up more, I've been traveling more again, and I had a couple speaking engagements. And a couple weeks ago, I was in Charlotte, North Carolina for a, for a two-day event. And I was at the counter to get my rental car, and I had rented the, the cheapest little compact car I could get because I don't like to spend money on them. And the lady at the counter tells me, we're all out of compact cars. And I said, okay, what are my options? 
And she said, all I have left is a premium full-size pickup truck. I can give it to you for the same price. I said, that'll do. That'll work just fine. Boy, I had fun in that truck, too. But as I was signing all of the details and, 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 and reading all of that, it occurred to me again that this contract that you make with the rental car company is based on mutual distrust. Mutual distrust. I don't trust the rental car company. And they don't trust me. So we have this contract in place to protect one another. A covenant is completely different from a contract. The biblical idea of covenant is, is one that's a mutual commitment and it involves not only two people, but also God and the two people saying, we're coming to this not with mistrust, but we're entrusting our lives to one another, 100% right now, just as we are with one another. Many times these Old Testament covenants were symbolized by the shedding of blood. Sometimes they would even uh, cut, cut a place on their hands and then shake hands because blood represented life itself. So covenant is God's idea all the way through the Bible until we get to the new covenant that's sealed by the blood of Jesus where God promises to give us new life in Christ and we covenant to live for Jesus, not for ourselves. All of this imagery links up together in what our understanding of marriage should be. If you've been to a, to a wedding, all of them start pretty much the same way. It usually starts with these words. We're gathered together in the sight of God to witness and bless the joining together of this man and woman in the holy covenant of marriage. The covenant of marriage was established by God who created us male and female for each other and is a symbol of the mystical union between Christ and in his church. Why do we say all of that? Because the story of scripture begins in a garden with a wedding in Genesis. And if you flip all the way to the back of your Bible in Revelation, you'll see that John envisions a divine royal wedding. In Revelation 21, he says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old heaven and the old earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. The imagery is all over the place. Scripture begins and ends with a wedding. And as followers of Jesus, we keep looking forward to the greatest wedding of all time. When Jesus comes back, he's coming back for his bride, the church. All marriage covenants, even the best marriages, are a sneak peek and to the greater covenant in Scripture. And since covenants are made with God as one of the parties, it means that when our human energy runs out, there's a whole other source of power available to us. It's like a a safety net that can catch us when we fail and when we fall. Marriage is messy, but the marriage covenant includes God. Because of that, two imperfect people can find the strength that they need in this covenant together. That imagery is all over scripture. So it grieves me so much that our culture takes this covenant of marriage so extremely lightly as something that can be ignored or something that can be disposed of so easily. But let me pause and say a word to anyone who's been through a divorce. Sometimes divorce is the best of bad options. I've never met somebody who's been through a divorce that went, oh, that was the best decision I've ever made. It's always a wound. And and all throughout Scripture, from the time of Moses, even to Jesus' own ministry, exceptions are made. And while it's always heartbreaking, divorce can be a reluctant necessity. As long as marriages are made up of imperfect people, some marriages are going to fail. And if you've been there, I want you to know this. It's not a lifetime curse. You don't need to wear a scarlet letter. You're not a second-rate follower of Jesus. The ground is level at the foot of the cross because every single one of us is in need of God's grace. God can make all things and all people new. So when it comes to this covenant messiness of marriage, how do we live out these covenant promises? As with all of these messy relationships we've been talking about, The point has been all along that we can't do it on our own strength. We need the power that comes from God. We need the power that comes from the Holy Spirit. 
We've looked at God's creative intent for marriage in Genesis 1 and 2. I'm going to flip to the New Testament for a second. In Paul's letter to the Galatians in chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, he says this, Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For, the flesh desire, for what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you should. And I think that anyone that's been doing the Christian life for longer than five minutes knows that this passage is true. There are two natures of us that are battling with one another, and frankly, our good intentions don't cut it. We need a power greater than ourselves to restore us, not only to sanity, but the Holy Spirit's power to help us to love one another in relationship. So Paul says, let the Holy Spirit guide your life. Live by the Spirit. This means that each of us in all relationships, and especially in marriage, are both followers and we're being led by the Spirit to love one another. So in marriage, we need the presence and power of the Holy Spirit to lead us. We need to renew our covenant with Christ and with one another. Let me say a few words about that. Our covenant with Jesus and our covenant with one another both need renewed. In marriage, I've experienced some of my most amazing moments in life. Some of the greatest joys of my life have been during marriage. But there have also been seasons that were filled with great pain. We've walked together through financial strain, seasons of depression and anxiety, car accident, death of family members, family fights. We've been through it all. And I think what's kept us through all of those times has been our trust in Jesus. We cling to him, trusting that he's also clinging to us. So if you find yourself in a messy marriage, cling to Christ and know that mysteriously, supernaturally, he's clinging to you. And we need to cling to and trust the covenant of marriage so that when your power and strength runs out, when you're feeling anything but loving or joyful or peaceful or patient with one another, to know that there's a power available through the Holy Spirit to come into your marriage and do for both of you what you can't do on your own. Live by the Spirit, Paul says. It's about renewing the covenant that we have with one another in, in, in all of our relationships, but also our covenant with Jesus, trusting in the power of the Spirit. So I want to I end this message today and, and, and end this entire series on messy relationships by praying first for marriages and then for all relationships, especially those that find themselves in a stuck and messy place. So let's be in an attitude of prayer together. And first, we're going to spend a few moments praying for marriages. And if you're, if you're here today and, and you're married and you happen to be sitting next to your husband or wife, great. Reach out and grab their hand. And we're going to pray together for all marriages. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you are full of grace for us and you come seeking us out of your deep love for us. God, today I pray for the marriages of everyone under the sound of my voice. Each one of these couples, Lord, would they know your great love for them. Lord, that they would know that they're each created in your image and that you love them with an everlasting love. And I pray, Lord, that you would so fill them with your Holy Spirit today that they might be filled with the fruits of the Spirit, that they might love each other and they might be patient and kind with one another, that they might be gentle with one another, that they would keep no record of wrongs, that they would rejoice not in evil but in the truth. Lord, help them to know your love so that your love can spill out to one another. And now I want to pray for every single person here. God, for every person under the sound of my voice, Jesus, I'm thinking of all of our relationships. The relationship that we have with you, our relationships with our friends, the relationships that we have with our children and grandchildren and parents, the relationships we, the messy relationships we have in our families of origin. Thinking of all of those relationships, God, we need you and we're again in need of your help and your grace. Jesus, thank you for restoring our relationship with the Father 
And Lord, out of that fullness, now let it spill out into our lives. Make beautiful things out of the brokenness of our lives. Spirit of the living God, pour yourself afresh and anew in each of us. Help us to love you. Lord, we ask for your help. We thank you for the blessing that you give to us, even in the midst of our mess. We thank you for the people that you have put into our lives that we're blessed to do life with, even when it's messy. And I pray, God, that you would bless all of these relationships. And when it's messy, when it feels broken, Holy Spirit, would you come and allow grace to fill in the gaps and make something beautiful out of our brokenness. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we close our service this morning, we're going to sing a really simple uh, praise chorus. It's called Something Beautiful. And, and, and I want that to be our prayer today, that, that, that God would continue to make something beautiful out of the brokenness that exists in your own heart and make something beautiful out of the messiness of the relationships that you're engaged with. So let's stand together, and we're going to sing this through uh, three times. How's that? It's really short. Three times, and, and just in a, in a prayerful and, and thoughtful way. It starts there. It starts with the restoration of our relationship with God. When we begin to understand that he makes something beautiful out of the brokenness of our lives, that can begin to spill over into all of the other relationships that we have. It starts there, and it finishes with grace and the glory that can only belong to him. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Have a great week. Love y'all.